Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Moore. Well, hi there, everybody, and welcome to To Tell the Truth. Hope you'll forgive my not getting up, but just before the program, our producer said something to me that I simply will not stand for. And that's why I'm sitting down. I'll tell you exactly what he said right after we meet the panel, here on To Tell the Truth. Jack Cassidy! to to tell the truth Uh, you heard me say uh, just a minute ago that the producer before the program said something that I just simply could not stand for and what he said for me was he said any dummy can do this show (laughs) (laughs) and I told him his was mistaken that it takes a very special dummy to do this show does that look like me? No. Yes. It wouldn't yes, it does. A, it a looks... little more lively, but it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> that is very good. You know, it's the creepiest feeling to sit yeah. beside yourself. I've been doing it for years. It hasn't bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, the folks who who created this thing were kind enough to say, "Would you like to take it home as a gift for your wife?" Oh. I, she'd have heart failure the minute she opened the thing, oh, you know? Oh, It, it really is good, you know it? It, it is? Yeah, it yeah. really is. I'm terribly sorry to hear that. I want to borrow the rug when you finish with it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the time I went to the uh, Wax Museum at Coney Island, and they had a big sign outside, Scoop of the Decade, uh, Death of Stalin. So I went in to see that, and there he was. But then I wandered to the back of the Penny Arcade, and the big three meeting at the altar was only Roosevelt and Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at any rate, this imposter dummy was brought here by our first guest, and we will meet him right now. Number one, what is your name, please? My name is Edward Marcus. Number two. My name is Edward Marcus. Number three. My name is Edward Marcus. All righty, and now let us hear the story of Edward Marcus. It's interesting. I, Edward Marcus, am the chairman of the board of the most famous Texas store, Neiman Marcus. For years, my pet project has been the mouth-watering Christmas catalog. Our recent Christmas catalog featured his and her look-just-like-yourself dummies, of which the Gary Moore dummy on today's show is an example. In past years, some of our spectacular catalog offerings have been his and her airplanes, his and her bathtubs, and his and her antique mummy cases. In addition to lower priced items, we have had such Texas size offerings as an ermine bathrobe, a 30 foot Chinese junk, and a latter day Noah's Ark stocked with endangered animals. Neiman Marcus's kooky gift items began back in 1955 when Edward R. Murrow asked my brother Stanley what we were offering for Christmas. My brother jokingly said that for $5,000, we would gift wrap a live steer on the hoof, plus a silver serving cart. We found we actually got a few orders for this wild combo. And from then on, the ultra unusual was expected from Neiman Marcus. Signed, Edward Marcus. And we'll find out more. What a stunning looking fellow. We'll find out more about the fabulous world of Neiman Marcus right after these commercials. This is me over here. 
Now, over across the way here, we have three distinguished gentlemen, all claiming to be Edward Marcus, chairman of the board of Neiman Marcus, and the man for, uh, responsible for creating this Gary Moore dummy. And we'll begin the question with Miss Carlyle, please. Well, all I can say is, whoever you are, Mr. Marcus, what never next? <laughs> <laughs> Number one, how did you keep that live steer quiet on the silver uh, uh, serving cart, gift wrapped? Well, first of all, you pack him in a box with lots of holes in it and gift wrap him. And he'll keep quiet if the box is strong enough. The cart was on, its, on the side. Oh, I see. He wasn't sort of laid out on the cart. No, that's later. I see. <laughs> uh, number two, you're interested in the museum, I think, in uh, Dallas. What's it called? The Dallas Museum of Fine Arts. Thank you. And number three, you have something uh, in your emporium at Neiman Marcus that is the best I ever tasted in my whole life, and you give it free with lunch. What is it? Oh, that's that special candy that we have. I see. Uh, Thank you, Kitty. Let's go down to Jack Cassidy. Oh, right. yes. Uh, number three... What's the name of the hotel that's across from the Neiman Marcus store in Dallas? Number three? Oh, I'm sorry. What's I, the name of the hotel across from the Neiman Marcus store? That, that is the uh, Dallas Hotel. The Dallas Hotel. Number, number two, do you agree with that? There isn't a hotel across the street from Neiman Marcus. Number one, what's the name of the hotel across from the store? There isn't one. I see. Okay. <laughs> you went in something by mistake there. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I'm up? <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Let's go to Peggy. I never got to the room number. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 Paul, you got the wrong one. I'm over here. Over here, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a gun, you know, you're working with a nearsighted director. What are you going to do? <laughs> I know I'm not getting my turn. <laughs> now we go to Peggy. Number two, who is Helen Corbett? Helen Corbett was the head of our Zodiac rooms. Thank you. Uh, number one, what does Bal Harbor mean to you? Well, that's where one of our stores is in, in Miami. Thank you. And uh, number two, what's the Stonely? The Stonely is a hotel in the suburbs. Thank you. Uh, number one, uh, what nights can you have dinner at the Zodiac Room? Thursday nights. Thank you. Uh, oh, <laughs> that, oh I used to spend a lot of time there. <laughs> Number two, well, they're delicious black velvets. Number two, what kind of, uh, what's different about your sugar? It, it used to be blue. Very personal question. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to try not much the questioning if you don't mind. <laughs> only, only his doctor knows for sure. <laughs> let's, let's, go to, <laughs> let's go to Orson, please. Number three, if Gary were to have commissioned this uh, self-portrait of himself, what would you have charged him to make it? It would have been $3,000 for the commissioning, plus the uh, flight uh, both ways of the artist who would uh, yeah. do the commission. Have you ever had a rich weirdo that wanted several of his wife or anything? Or uh, <laughs> want to go into little No, but details? We, uh, we're expecting calls. Oh, are you? Number one... Um, what, uh, are, are rich Texans feeling the pinch like the rest of the country? And apparently there are still people willing to lay out three grand for a well, wax dummy? Well, to uh, look at our Christmas business, uh, the, the answer is no. Well, my wife ordered something out of your catalog and was happy with it. <laughs> all right, Orson, uh, that was the bell that cuts off all further questioning and means it's time that we must mark our ballots. And we marked them for Mr. Marcus number one or Mr. Marcus number two, or Mr. Marcus number three. The rules, as you know, are that we pay $50 for each wrong vote. We pay $500 if all the votes are wrong. And Kitty starts, please. Before I say who I voted for, I must apologize. Mr. Marcus and his wife entertained my husband and me in Dallas, but it was so long ago, I don't remember which one it was. So I voted for number one. All righty, you got to vote for number one. We're going down to Jack. Well, I was at the same party, Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember you either. I... <laughs> <laughs> I'll forget all of you, too. <laughs> I voted for number three because um, there is a hotel near the Neiman Marcus. One? I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> it's not across the street. All righty, we've oh. got it three showing. And Peggy, what do you want to do? Well, number two said the stone was out in the suburbs, and I hardly call that the it suburb. Is. It's not really the suburbs. I'll Come on. I voted for number one because they have a store at Bell Harbor, and I don't think anybody 
But the real, again, the customers in Miami, of course, would know about that. So I voted for you, number one. A pair of ones and a three and I arson. I voted for number three because he knew about that delicious candy that apparently... No, it's chicken and soup! It's chicken and soup! Uh, chicken soup. <laughs> 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 well, now, we had two votes for the chicken soup. Somebody else had the candy. Jack had the department store. And so hotel. with that, will the real Edward Marcus please stand up, sir? Oh. Uh, <laughs> And you stumped the panel, gentlemen. You got $500, which is the most you can get here. Number one, sir, tell us about yourself. What's your real name? What do you do? My name is Rex Brock, Senior Vice President for Braniff International Airways. Well, That's a pretty good outfit. <laughs> Number three, will you tell us about you? My name is Sam Gerard. I'm Vice President and Treasurer of Eaton Factors Company. Oh, good. Mr. Marcus, Kitty has already remarked that she met you some years ago. However, her memory does not go back far enough. She remembers uh, back to when uh, you entertained her husband uh, and uh, Kitty. W when does your memory go back to with Kitty? Well, that was about 13 or 14 years ago, That's but right. my memory goes back to about 26 years ago, 27 years ago. Thanks. We did not meet, but our mothers met and decided that we ought to meet each other because we were both single. <laughs> naturally we both resisted we both resisted the uh, parental guidance and so I married Betty and you married Moss that's right <laughs> could have been called Neiman Carlisle right. <laughs> it's been a marvelous spot thank you very much Mr. Marcus thank you gentlemen and thank you whoever you are for being with us on the Now, you know, my friends, strange and mysterious events occur in a certain area of the Atlantic Ocean. You've perhaps read about it, ships, planes, and people vanish and are never heard from again. Now, our next guest has studied this peculiar and almost supernatural area, and he'll be here to tell us about it in just about two minutes. Now, let's meet the man who is looking for an answer to one of the continuing mysteries of this mysterious world of ours. Number one, what is your name, please? My name is John Wallace Spencer. Number two. My name is John Wallace Spencer. Number three. My name is John Wallace Spencer. And here is the deep sea document and fascinating of John Wallace Spencer. He has written here, I, John Wallace Spencer, have made an in-depth study of an area of the Atlantic Ocean where strange and mysterious events occur. More than a thousand people and over a hundred ships and planes have vanished mysteriously in that part of the ocean bounded by North America, the Azores, and the West Indies. In this limbo area are the islands of Bermuda and the Bahamas. It was here that five Navy bombers on a training mission vanished without a trace. It was here that the atomic submarine Scorpion went to the bottom for no known reason. And it was here that the ill-fated ship Mary Celeste's entire crew disappeared from the face of the earth. I have written a book documenting these events and offering various theories of what might possibly be responsible. My book is called Limbo of the Lost. Signed, John Wallace Spencer. <laughs> And Orson, I heard you say that you read something about this, so you want to start? Oh, yeah. I've always been fascinated with this, so number three, can you give me your theory of, say, the disappearance of the crew of the Marie Celeste? Well, I believe that uh, UFOs are involved in this type of thing, and I believe UFOs, uh, at least a UFO, took the people off the Marie Celeste, including the cat, of course. Number one, do you oh. believe in the UFO? Uh, That's one idea? theory. My pet theory is the vortex theory, I think. What is that? Well, it's much like a bathtub with a stopper being pulled out. What happens is the bottom of the sea falls out, and there is a tremendous whirlpool that sucks down everything in sight. Well, number two, why would the, do you agree with, with, with number one as a probable theory? No, sir, my theory is scientific, and we call it the plateau theory, or the theory of the plates. The Earth is constructed, as you know, in a series of plateaus, not a solid mass. 
these constantly move, and if and when two of these move fast enough apart, they create an enormous suction. And in the sea, in this area that we call limbo lost, it's very possible with the currents to do this kind of drawing apart. That's one's theory, theory fancied up a little. <laughs> All right, uh, Orson, let's go to Kitty. Thank you. Well, number one, uh, if it is a vortex theory, how, why is it that the Marie Celeste was found floating on the top of the ocean with nothing disturbed? The food was on the table. You mean the vortex just sucked the people off? Not and necessarily. And left the ship sitting there? Not necessarily. Uh, the ship could have been thrown out against the outer ridge of the vortex. The people on board, the sailors, of course, could have, have jumped overseas. Thank you. It would have disturbed the food on the table and the dishes, well, we don't it seems know, to do me. We? Yeah, it was found well. that way. Number two, um, uh, what do you suppose happened to the... Uh, the, the, the training ships that were up in the air. I mean, they couldn't have been sucked down by the sea. Yes, yes, they could. This oh, way, you're talking about the Fort Lauderdale flights of the five ships and then the yeah. flying boat afterwards. Well, again, this theory says that the suction is so great that it will not only take surface vessels, ah. but, but it'll affect the, the atmosphere above it. I see. Number three, then. Sorry, Kitty, we're I'm going down to Jack. Uh, number one, what year was it that the, the planes disappeared? 1946. Do you agree with that, number two? Yes, I do. Uh-huh. Um, the area which you've described in, in this little uh, chapter we have here, is, uh, is there any specific area, like within a 20-mile radius, number two? Forgive me. No, the limbo is a larger area than that. If you go east into the Atlantic from Cape May to the continental shelf down the coast of the U.S., then go west into the Gulf of Mexico, incorporate Bermuda and the Azores, that's what I call the limbo of the lost. Number three... Uh, two of the theories were given before. Do you give more than two theories in your book? No, there are no theories in the book at all. The book is a book of facts. Uh -huh. And Peggy Cash goes last. Number one, how many square miles is this limbo? Uh, approximately the size of the United States of America. Oh, holy cow, number two. If just a, like that many, this, you know, that's like saying that everybody that died today in America had some mysterious death. I mean, that's not such a lot of a lot of people to go down in such a big area, is it? Yes, it is. When you consider that these, all these accidents have left no traces, this is an enormously traveled area, both by boat and plane. Well, when, when was the Marie Celeste? The Marie Celeste was 1876. Well, number three, I don't imagine it was the BMT subway at the rush hour and then, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't wish to dampen your theory, but I mean, that's a pretty big area. Oh, well. Uh, number two. Oh. And there goes the bell, and I see that signal, which means you've got to mark your ballots fast while the audience and I look over here quickly at number one, number two, and number three. And Orson, if you've completed yours, we'll ask you to tell us who you voted for and why. I voted for number three. Um, he didn't get a chance to answer many questions because he wasn't asked many. I don't believe any of them, that's the truth we know. <laughs> All right. He said less than the others because nobody asked him. Much. So there goes the number three in Kitty Carlisle. I don't believe any of them either. I should have voted for number three because somebody definitely went and took those people off the Mary Celeste. That ship wasn't disturbed by anything. Don't look at me. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and number two said that the area was as big as the United States. That area down there isn't that big. And number, oh, well. <laughs> and so we've got a two showing, a two and a three, and Jack Cassidy coming. Well, I voted for number three, Gary, because he said uh, he contradicted the fact that it is not theory. He said that it's fact. And anyone who sounds that purposeful, I believe, is a writer. That's against you. All right. And Peg? I don't believe in plates and bathtubs. Forget yeah. it. And I don't believe in any of it. But I really believe that if you're going to believe something nutty like that, you might as well believe in United Flying Objects or whatever they are. <laughs> Unknown United Flying United Objects. Flying objects. <laughs> United, United Flying Objects. The, the delivery service. <laughs> Votes are all in. <laughs> Will the real John Wallace Spencer, sir, please stand up? Almost got it. <laughs> Let's find out who your imposters were. Number one, what is your real name? What do you do? My name is George Weezer, and I'm an independent motion picture producer. And good to have you with us. Number two, sir? My name is Bruce Gray, and I'm assistant to the president of King Casey Incorporated, an industrial design firm. Mr. Spencer, where, there are a lot of people going to write to us and ask us where they can get this book. Where may they get it? Well, the easiest uh, thing to do is send a postcard to the Phillips Publishing Company in Phillips. Westfield, Massachusetts. Phillips Publishing, Westfield, Massachusetts. Uh, 
Hercules. Because of time, we're going to have to do a quick job on this, but each one of these plaques and each of these planes represents some unexplained disaster. Planes or ships that have disappeared. Which one do you want? Shall we pick out the, the most, the best known one? Well, the Lost Patrol. This happened in 1945, as a matter of fact. Five planes left Fort Lauderdale U.S. Naval Air Station to fly out on a training mission about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They were scheduled to return to Fort Lauderdale at 5.30. 5.25, the command pilot of the five planes radioed in that he was lost. And I said, how in the world can you be lost? Each plane's carrying a crew of three, a navigator, experienced combat flyers. You can't be lost off the coast. And he said, nevertheless, we are. We don't know if we're over the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico. At this point, Air Sea Rescue had a huge Martin Mariner flying boat standing by on the runway in case they needed it. His guest position was 200 miles northeast of Miami. At least it was at least their guest position. The executive officer of the station was in the control tower listening to the pilot's conversation going back and forth, bordering on hysteria. In fact, at one point, the command pilot was about to turn control over to one of the other pilots. And all of a sudden, as if somebody pulled a switch, all five planes disappeared. At this point, the huge Martin Mariner flying boat took off with 13 air sea rescue personnel aboard. Several communiques received back and forth, and all of a sudden, as if somebody pulled that same switch, it disappeared. So six military aircraft and 27 military personnel vanished while communicating with their control tower. And that's just one story, and it goes, thousands of people have vanished in that particular area, whether they were aboard aircraft, civilian airliners, military, you name it, it's happening, it's still happening today. Mr. Spencer, all I can say in topping that is that tomorrow morning, I take off, I fly from New York directly down to the Bahamas, right across there. I may never see you again, but thank you for being with luck. Today will receive a Bissell Sweetmaster. Electric, all four vacuum that needs no attachment, stores as easy as cleans. Bissell cares about your home. Promotional consideration provided by Best Western Motels, the nation's largest chain of 1,200 fine owner operated motels in 900 cities from coast to coast. This is Bill Wendell speaking for To Tell the Truth, a Mark Goodson, Bill Tottman production.